Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, September the 15th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on ascetism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together, through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish, perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and ascetism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Our Book of Concord reading today is our continuation of Article 5 from the Apology to the Augsburg Confession. Love and Fulfilling the Law, and again a reminder that is also can be read as the Gospel and also Sanctification, beginning in paragraph 165. So far we have reviewed the chief passages that the adversaries cite against us. They point to these passages to try to show that faith does not justify and that we merit the forgiveness of sins and grace by our works. But we hope that we have shown clearly enough to godly consciences that these passages are not opposed to our doctrine. The adversaries wickedly distort the scripture to their opinions. Most of the passages that they cite have been garbled, while leaving out the clearest passages about faith, 
they only select from the scripture passages about works, and even these they distort. Everywhere they add certain human opinions to what the words of scripture say. They teach the law in such a way as to suppress the gospel about Christ. The entire doctrine of the adversaries is, in part, derived from human reason. In part, it is a doctrine of the law, not of the gospel. For they teach two ways of justification, one derived from reason and the other derived from the law, not from the gospel or the promise about Christ. We begin a new section. The adversaries teaching based on reason and the law. The former way of justification they teach is that people merit grace by good works, both in a merely agreeable way, de congruo, and in a wholly deserving way, de condigno. This way is a doctrine of reason, for reason, not seeing the uncleanness of the heart, thinks that it pleases God if it performs good works. Therefore, other works and other acts of worship are constantly invented by people in great peril, to defend against the terrors of conscience. The pagans and the Israelites slew human victims and undertook many other most painful works in order to appease God's anger. Afterward, orders of monks were invented, and these challenged each other in the severity of their observations against the terrors of conscience and God's anger. This way of justification, because it is according to reason and is completely occupied with outward works, can be understood and be done to a certain extent. To this end, Camden lawyers have distorted the misunderstood church ordinances, which were enacted by the fathers for a far different purpose. The fathers did not intend that we follow the ordinances in order to seek after righteousness, but they were given for the sake of mutual peace among people, so there might be a certain order in the church. In this way, the canon lawyers also distorted the sacraments, and most especially the Mass. Through them, they seek righteousness, grace, and salvation by the outward act. Another way of justification is handed down by the scholastic theologians when they teach that we are righteous through a habit infused by God, which is love. They say that, aided by this habit, we keep God's law outwardly and inwardly, and that this fulfilling of the law is worthy of grace and eternal life. This doctrine is plainly the doctrine of the law, for what the law says is true, you shall love the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 6.5. Also, you shall love your neighbor, Leviticus 19.18. Love is, therefore, the fulfilling of the law. But it is easy for a Christian to judge about both of these ways of justification because both exclude Christ. They are, therefore, to be rejected. In the former, which teaches that our works are an atoning sacrifice for sin, the impiety is clear. The latter way contains much that is harmful. It does not teach that, when we are born again, we make use of Christ. It does not teach that justification is the forgiveness of sins. It does not teach that we attain the forgiveness of sins before we love, but falsely represents that we rouse in ourselves the act of love, through which we merit the forgiveness of sins. Nor does it teach that we overcome the terrors of sin and death through faith in Christ. It falsely claims that, by their own fulfilling of the law without Christ as the atoning sacrifice, people come to God. Finally, it claims that this very fulfilling of the law without Christ as the atoning sacrifice is righteousness, worthy of grace and eternal life. Nevertheless, scarcely a weak and feeble fulfilling of the law happens even in saints. Truly, if everyone will think about it, he will most easily understand that the gospel has not been given in vain to the world, and that Christ has not been promised and set forth, has not been born, has not suffered, has not risen again in vain. He will most easily understand that we are justified not by reason or by the law. Therefore, in regard to justification, we are compelled to disagree with the adversaries. For the gospel shows another way. The gospel compels us to make use of Christ in justification. The gospel teaches that through Christ we have access to God through faith. It teaches that we ought to set him as mediator and atoning sacrifice against God's anger. The gospel teaches that through faith in Christ the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation are received, and the terrors of sin and of death are overcome. Paul also says that righteousness is not of the law, but of the promise. The Father has promised that he wants to forgive, that for Christ's sake he wants to be reconciled. This promise, however, is received through faith alone, as Paul testifies in Romans 4.13. This faith alone receives the forgiveness of sins, justifies, and regenerates. Then love and other good fruit follow. Therefore we teach that a person is justified, as we have said above, when conscience 
terrified by the preaching of repentance, is cheered and believes that for Christ's sake it has reconciled God. Faith is counted as righteousness before God. Romans 4, 3 and 5. When the heart is cheered and quickened through faith in this way, it receives the Holy Spirit. He renews us so that we are able to keep the law, to love God and God's word, to be submissive to God in afflictions, to be chaste, to love our neighbor, and so on. Even though these works are far from the perfection of the law, on account of faith they please God. Through faith we are accounted righteous because we believe that, for Christ's sake, we have a reconciled God. These things are plain and in harmony with the gospel and can be understood by persons of sound mind. From this foundation it can easily be decided why we attribute justification to faith and not to love. Love follows faith because love is the fulfilling of the law, Romans 13.10. But Paul teaches that we are justified not from the law, but from the promise, which is received only through faith. We neither come to God without Christ as mediator, nor receive the forgiveness of sins for the sake of our love, but for the sake of Christ. Likewise, we are not able to love God while he is angry, and the law always accuses us, always presents an angry God to us. Therefore, we must first take the promise through faith that, for Christ's sake, the Father is reconciled and forgives. Afterward, we begin to keep the law. Our eyes are to be cast far away from human reason, far away from Moses, upon Christ. We are to believe that Christ is given to us in order that for his sake we may be counted righteous. In the flesh we never satisfy the law. Therefore we are counted righteous not because of the law, but because of Christ. His merits are granted us if we believe on him. We are not justified by the law because human nature cannot keep God's law and cannot love God. We are justified from the promise in which, for Christ's sake, reconciliation, righteousness, and eternal life have been promised. If anyone, therefore, has considered these foundations, he will easily understand that justification must necessarily be attributed to faith. It is not in vain that Christ has been promised and set forth, that he has been born and has suffered and been raised again. The promise of grace in Christ is not in vain. It was made immediately from the beginning of the world, apart from and beyond the law. The promise should be received through faith, as 1 John 5, 10-12 says. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne according to his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and that this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Christ says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. John 8.36 Paul says in Romans 5.2 through him we have also obtained access, by faith, into this grace in which we stand. By faith in Christ, therefore, the promise of the forgiveness of sins and of righteousness is received. Neither are we justified before God by reason of the law. And we will stop there tonight, I think. Yes, we'll stop there tonight. And we join together now in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy, with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time. For behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. 
O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who would stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war, held as slaves and sacrifices of earthly wrath, may return to their home, stand by all refugees and homeless people, and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness, and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example, and the example of so many holy martyrs, to be ever watchful of the confession of your Son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace, that we may withstand all trials, and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.